I've always thought of myself as an adventurous person, a free spirit, if you will. I got my first passport before I could walk. I learned to drive my mom's rusted Lady Liberty Green half-ton Chevy when I was eight so I could feed the horses that decorated our five-acre farm. I moved out of state for college. And to this day, I still eat raw cookie dough every once in a while. Wild card, right? When I met my partner, Justin, I realized I was an amateur. If there was an adventure spectrum, I fell somewhere slightly right of middle. For example, I like camping, but I'm not morally opposed to all-inclusive resorts. <laughs> he, on the other hand, has an outspoken commitment to testing his comfort zone. He firmly believes that traveling is the fastest, most efficient way to challenge those boundaries. Stretching, he calls it. Now, don't get me wrong, I like stretching, but I like yoga. I like choreographed, carefully planned stretching. I like having a backup plan in case all hell breaks loose. We had only been dating a year when we embarked on our second international trip together. For nine weeks, we would backpack around Zambia and Malawi and maybe Botswana if there was time. I bought guidebooks. He bought a one-way flight. I suggested we make reservations. He said we'd get a better deal if we just showed up. We have to leave a little room for magic, he'd remind me whenever I tried to book accommodation more than one day in advance. And so the stretching began. Just getting to Zambia required three layovers, four planes, and almost two whole days. And my initiation only accelerated once we arrived. On our way to a remote safari, I learned how to hitchhike. And we sat in the back of a pickup truck among empty Coke bottles that rattled like slot machine winnings. I learned that some people don't think it's funny when you joke about pushing your partner off a world of wonder. Uh. And, <laughs> and I learned that you don't just get used to the rancid smell of burning trash, you even come to like it. By the time we made it to Malawi, we were about halfway through our trip and I was relieved that we had agreed to stay put for a while. We'd done it, I figured. We'd stretched. And we would celebrate by booking a stilt raised cabin in Nakata Bay, resting on the rocky shores of Africa's third largest lake for three frickin' weeks. Plenty of time for me to plan our route home. <laughs> a few of the fellow travelers we had talked to had convinced us that we had to see Mozambique and we could get there one of two ways. We could either take a bus around the southern tip of the 365 mile long lake, or we could cut the journey in half by taking a boat across its 50 mile width. Sure, we didn't know for sure whether we could get a visa on the ferry, but we did know the island on the way had an outsized reputation. The hostel there was rumored to have a waterfront bar with multi-level decks, sun loungers, and a plunge pool. I had earned that much, hadn't I? <laughs> so we consulted the hostel staff who told us there were usually two boats we could take to Chizumulu, or Chizzy as it's affectionately known. Promising, I thought, until the bartender told us that the main ferry had crashed and was still under repair. I wanted to know about the crash. Were there passengers? Did they survive? <laughs> was this common? <laughs> Justin wanted to know if there was another boat. <laughs> there was, the bartender assured us. We could take the Ubali. Unlike the ferry, though, the Ubali was a small wooden cargo boat. Locals often took it to the island, but it certainly wasn't made for tourism. In fact, it sounded like it was hardly even buoyant. I assumed we'd wait, we'd reconsider the bus, or maybe we'd just go to Botswana like we had originally planned. But Justin? For him, this held the promise of an irresistible stretch. 
So we showed up ashore early Saturday morning for what we had been told would be an 8 a.m. departure. And we spotted it immediately. It's peeling blue paint. It's tarp strung haphazardly over its skeletal top. It's low frame barely rising above the surface of the water. And my nerves mounted as we boarded the rickety Ubali with our 30 pound packs. I tried to ignore the feeling of my stomach turning itself inside out, eager to empty its contents. And while the other passengers joined us, we did what any self-respecting adventurer would do. We took a selfie. <laughs> I had almost managed to psych myself up for the journey when the motor sputtered to a stop. We hadn't even pulled up the anchor. I looked around as chatter rose, but I couldn't make sense of what was happening. Everyone else on the boat was speaking Chichewa, the local tribal language. Ten minutes passed, and then thirty, until all at once people started disembarking. The Ubali needed a new motor, someone told us after seeing our confusion. It could be a while. <laughs> well, we tried. I thought to myself, sure, we would have to go another route. And I was reaching for my things when I saw Justin stand up with only his day pack, leaving his big bag on the warped wooden floor. Wait. He still wanted to do this? He saw my look of disbelief, countered with his all too casual, you're damn right, smile, and extended his hand to help me up. What about our stuff, I wondered aloud this time. We're just gonna leave it here on the motorless boat? But he swore it would be fine, and we too disembarked. For an hour, we sat in the shade of the port, staring at the Ubali, full of cargo, but empty of promise. <laughs> By midday, I was hungry, and I let it be known. <laughs> if I was going to endure this, I was damn well gonna do it with a full stomach. So we walked to town to visit our favorite street food vendor who served up a mean chips my eye. The local delicacy of salty fries and cabbage would be the quickest option in case the Ubali suddenly sprang to life. We also stopped at the bar to dilute our impatience in case it didn't. <laughs> Armed with what I thought could easily be our last meal, we went back to the water and propped ourselves against an old dugout canoe. I didn't know how long Justin would be willing to wait before admitting defeat, and I welcomed the distraction when some people we'd met in town came over to chat with us. We sat there together for hours, passing time perched between the cool shade and the warm sand, Justin and I drinking Carlsbergs, or Greenies as the locals call them, our friends drinking Chibuku, a local liquor made from malted maize. We watched children play naked on anchored boats with empty liquor cartons and castaway fishing nets. And I envied their carefree nature, just as I did Justin's. I looked up to see an African man wearing a white embroidered polo coming toward us. He told us his name was Michael, and he was also waiting for the Ubali. He recognized us because we had been the only Mzungos, the only white people, on the boat earlier and he had asked if we heard any news. Of course we hadn't. He asked us why we were going to the islands and why we were taking the Ubali. And then he asked us if we knew how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, he told us. He was scared to take the boat, but he had to deliver medical supplies to the island. I felt a sudden pang of shame then. If Michael could brave the Ubali, couldn't I? The sun had all but set when we finally heard the new motor approach life. I fluttered between feelings of relief and reluctance at the realization that we might actually take this boat after all. When our friends told us that the 50cc motor had come from an old dirt bike, <laughs> I glared at Justin with wide eyes. He winked, unfazed. <laughs> To my surprise, the other passengers weren't discouraged either. They reappeared as quickly as they dispersed, ready to go. And Justin, our new friend Michael and I, joined the crowd to reboard the boat. And we settled in where we could, 
wedged between aged wooden planks, red crates full of neon soda bottles, and live chickens tucked into cardboard boxes, all of which had taken the priority seating. <laughs> As daylight faded and we sloshed away from shore, I could hear Michael calling his friends and family to tell them that he was leaving the security of dry land. Pray for me, he asked all of them. I'm surrounded by a forest of water. Soon, the waves grew into ocean-sized swells that slammed against the Ubrali's fragile frame. A few brave men, their bladders full of warm malt liquor, took turns balancing barefoot along the boat's edge to relieve themselves. Others, like myself, refused to move from their place of temporary, if imaginary, safety. I sunk myself low into a hollow space. I dropped my head against the warmth of Justin's shoulder and I closed my eyes. Even if we made it to Jizzy, even if this engine didn't quit out of sheer strain like the last one, it would take at least three hours, maybe four. Sleeping, I decided, would be the fastest way to pass the time. I woke to the sound of a splash. Someone fell in, I thought, still groggy. <laughs> in a single motion, I checked for Justin and hoisted myself up, preparing for the worst. But squinting into the night, I realized the man who'd gone overboard was anchoring the boat for us to unload. We'd reached Chisimaloo. As if to make sure that I wasn't still dreaming, the captain shouted that this was as close as he could go. We would have to get in the water. I struggled to see how deep it was, but when Justin jumped in, I followed. The cold lake water reaching for my thighs washed away any remnants of sleep as the captain handed us our packs and we waded to shore. I glanced at my watch. Midnight. And because electricity is heavily regulated, the island was as dark as the lake had been. That meant we would have to find our hostel using only our headlamps and our intuition. Thankfully, it was as close as our makeshift port and we stumbled to the grounds in search of a keeper. When there was none to be found, we gave up our hopes for a bed and pitched our tent on a patch of soft dirt under the outstretched branches of a giant baobab tree and a blanket of blinking stars. Then we waited for sleep to quiet this feeling of steady rocking that the Ubali left in the whole of our bodies. When the power returned at 8 a.m., music blared promptly through the speakers at the bar next door. I had only opened my eyes enough to see leaves dancing overhead when Justin nudged my side. Look, he nodded past me. Just outside our tent lay a vision of paradise, a mirage of lush palms, sun-baked sand, and azure waters that melted into the horizon. Or, as Justin would call it, magic. Just 24 hours after our journey with the Ubali began, I was glad to have taken it. I was proud to have stretched myself into another, still more adventurous shape. But it would be years before I learned that Ubali means partnership in Chichewa. Thank you.